Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the Marketing Director here at American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. First off, we want to thank our patron, Black & Beach, for sponsoring this webinar. Um, here with us today, we have Karen Palinch, the CEO at Alex Renew. Karen will be discussing one of their recent projects branded River Renew. Uh, before we get started, I just want to mention that you'll be able to message your questions at the end of the presentation. Once the presentation's over, you'll be able to type your question into the attendee chat panel on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll also share Karen's email address so you can email her directly with any additional questions you might have. Okay, let's get started. Hello, Karen. Thank you for joining us today, and we're ready when you are. All right. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It's uh, an honor here to lead Alex Renew, be their general manager, and take on this really prestigious program that we have branded River Renew. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, again, let's let me know if you have any questions. So there we go. Healthier Waterways, Healthier Alexandria. Um, a little bit about how I'm going to work this today for you. We're going to talk about our background. Um, we are basically uh, a regional wastewater treatment facility. We've taken on this new mission called River Renew. Talk about the tunnel project and the planning design construction elements that are going into it. And most importantly, the educational piece that we've put in place to make this happen. It's a very fast-tracked, very intense program. Uh, it really impacts our community. And it's important that we're able to take really high level engineering concepts, uh, construction concepts, and, and translate that for our public so that we get their support uh, while we're going through this really tough project um, in four, less, four or less years. So a little bit about Alexandria. Uh, we all know Alexandria, it's right here on the waterfront. We have a population now of about 160,000 people. Uh, over half of our residents have bachelor's degrees so they're very well educated. Um, they come from a very diverse background. They have a lot of good information to share with us. Uh, they're very engaged community. There's over 65 standing boards and commissions and committees that help the city council, the elected officials and the city staff uh, make decisions around their community. It is run by a city council. It's a city manager council um, arrangement. And we do have, um, while it's diverse, it's 15 square miles, we do have a historic old, old town district. One of the unique things, uh, it makes it a little challenging to message here in the city of Alexandria, is that no one entity um, really owns the accountability for water. It's split amongst various organizations, all with different structures. So Virginia American Water buys is a private company and it buys water from uh, other localities here, uh, Fairfax Water, other places, and then pumps it into the city. They distribute the water and they have their own billing system. We use that water here in our homes uh, and then that dirty water actually goes into private laterals which go into uh, mains that are owned by the city of Alexandria, the city owns and maintains both the separate sanitary sewers and the combined sewers uh, in the city of Alexandria. That wastewater then travels and gets picked up in our interceptors that Alex Renew owns. We own the pump stations here in the city, and then we own the treatment facility, which is located on about 33, 34 um, acres down here at the corner of Holland and Eisenhower. And of course, we produce um, great great quality effluent that goes back out into our community or gets reused um, on our, our systems. In addition to that, I'm sure you're aware of all the news going on that um, there's a lot of flooding that goes on in the city and the city itself owns the stormwater system. So it gets very confusing about who does what. So we have to be really thoughtful as we put the messages out, especially around something like River Renew. So just a little bit more about Alex Renew, you can see the Masonic Temple in the background. Uh, we're a small uh, authority. We were the first authority that was created in the Commonwealth of Virginia under the Virginia Water and Waste Authorities Act uh, in 1952. That gives us a lot of autonomy. We're um, a, a political subdivision. Uh, the city council appoints our board members. You can see we have a five member citizen board. 
they're very active and engaged um, and they truly enjoy um, environmental protection, they have to apply to be on our board. So it's great to have people who are really committed for the right reasons to help us make decisions uh, about environmental protection for water. We serve not just the city of Alexandria, we also serve portions of Fairfax County, and I'll show you that in a map in a bit. We are funded through sewer fees. We don't get any additional funding, um, whether it's through connection fees or otherwise, it's through sewer fees charged to our residents in the city or through wholesale services uh, provided to Fairfax County. And you can see that there. And there's also a little portion of the northwest corner of the city of Alexandria that is served by Arlington County. So here in Northern Virginia, we're very well connected uh, amongst all the counties to provide the best and most efficient services that we can. So as I said, we provide service both to um, the city of Alexandria, here's a small portion that goes over to Arlington, and then this large swath is Fairfax County and all of that portion of the county flows here to Alex Renew. This little purple piece is the piece that we're gonna be talking about a lot in a bit. This is where the combined sewer system resides. It's about 5% of the entire land area of the city of Alexandria. What you see in the green and the blue are, the, are separate storm sewer and separate sanitary sewer systems. And the sanitary sewers are owned and maintained either by Fairfax or the city uh, and then come to us. So this is the small combined area. And you can see this is a graphic that we've used with the community to try to get folks to understand the, the separate nature of stormwater versus um, wastewater and versus the combined sewer uh, to help them as the city embarks on a system to, or a program to really deal with their stormwater uh, issues at the same time that we're doing the large River Renew program. So what is River Renew? How did we end up with this? So this is our new initiative. It was really created um, in response to a law that the Virginia General, General Assembly passed in 2017. So the city of Alexandria prior to 2018 uh, in that small combined area also owned the four combined sewer outfalls associated with that combined area. Uh, rules had changed, TMDLs had been put in place. So they were working with the Virginia Department, uh, Department of Environmental Quality to redo their permitting around those four combined sewer outfalls. And um, we do have a river keeper here, the Potomac River Keeper got engaged, uh, which got the Virginia General Assembly engaged. And they passed a law in 2017 requiring the city to bring those four outfalls into compliance, either with the federal CSO rule or with the more stringent TMDL rules that were associated with the three uh, three of the outfalls. And this was required to be done by July 1st, 2025. We worked with the city because obviously there's a, a piece of this that was um, tied to the Alex Renew wastewater treatment facility or water recovery facility. And we all came to the conclusion that at the end of the day that the Alex Renew water resource recovery facility was the heartbeat of this job. And so the city transferred ownership of the four CSO outfalls in the associated um, construction design and construction project to remediate and meet this law to Alex Renew in July, on July 1st, 2018. So what is this? It, it, it's not just the tunnel project, but we had to do a number of projects really fast on our small site to make way for this tunnel program. It is, uh, in our minds, one of the most aggressive schedules there is to concept, design, plan, construct, uh, and start up a facility by July 1st, 2025. And then you can see the other three associated projects that we had to put in place in order to prep our site to do some of the work for the tunnel program. And here's the standards that we had to meet. Uh, you can see the four outfalls, 001 discharges into the Potomac River. Uh, that one meets the um, presumption approach through the CSO law. And you can see where we're expecting those flows to go after we complete River Renew in 2025. Outfall 002 goes into Hunting Creek, uh, and that is has a TMDL for 
bacteria associated with it with an 80% reduction. Three and four are the most difficult. While they're the smallest, they're still the most difficult. They're right there at Duke Street. They go into a small tributary called Hoof's Run. And um, basically, they, re they require almost 99% removal to get to this 98% capture overall. Um, and so we had our work cut out for us, figuring out how we were going to make that happen. Um, one of the things I did want to point out is um, that this is a, a, we were asked by the community to really look at um, uh, climate change. And so instead of using a typical year value, we used a climate period of 2000 to 2016 to try to be as upfront, as, you know, the most current data that we could use as possible. I think right now with climate change, it's a moving target and we really don't know what to, we're trying to project out a hundred years in the past into our future and, and we're it's a tough struggle. So we're trying to use as much current data as possible to set the, the rules around this. So here's River Renew. I talked about the things we had to do at our facility to essentially pave the way for this tunnel program that you see on the left-hand side. We had to upgrade some of our pumps in our um, preliminary primary area so that we can get our pumping capacity up and drain those tunnels um, and interceptors faster. We also, there was a building here, uh, it's no longer. This building, Building J, um, housed our lab, our administration facilities, uh, some locker spaces, the entire plant, HVAC, all of that had to be designed and moved in a year, um, basically. So you can see the timeline there. Uh, we took over in July 2018. It took us a year of really intense planning and design. Kudos to both my team and the, um, the Jacobs design team for really working through this to make this happen uh, and relocate those facilities, uh, including a, an operations control room, into what you see here, into this existing building that had some other other uses that had gone away and we moved that in. Uh, and then site security and access, we really needed to tighten that down. It's a really small site. Uh, we had to think about a flow of traffic. I don't have that slide in here, but there's gonna be you know upwards of, of 100 plus trucks a day coming in and out of this facility from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. as we mine this tunnel. So we needed to be cognizant of how we secured the facility and moved people around um, and had guards and other folks to help us keep the plant running at the same time we're moving all this dirt in and out of the facility, as well as all the resources needed to build that tunnel. So what are we building? And that's over here on the left. We awarded this contract at the end of 2020. Uh, and our contractor, uh, which is a design build contract, uh, Trailer Shade Joint Venture won that award. Um, they are still on schedule, uh, which is amazing. We're still on schedule between a government shutdown and a pandemic. Um, it has been a lot of stress for the team, but I have a great group of very talented um, owners, advisors, designers, and now a construction team to help us execute this job. So we have outfall 001 up here. Uh, you'll hear us refer to it as the Pendle Street, Pendleton Street outfall. We have 002, which is our Royal Street outfall. And then three and four. Um, three and four, we will be building the hoof run interceptor. This is along um, uh, the African American Park and it comes down into our facility. You can see our facility located here. We have a snowman shaft. Uh, so we have two different shafts there. One is a large pumping station. One is the entrance to the tunnel. Uh, we'll have a 12 foot diameter tunnel that skirts around here, um, goes through a, another historic area um, under a road by a school. Um, this is the entrance to Jones Point Park. So we worked with the National Park Service to secure an EA in record time uh, to make this work happen all the way up under the river uh, here to outfall 01 where we'll, we'll be pulling that out, uh, the TM uh, tunnel boring machine out. And you can see these are the construction costs of, of these jobs that we had. So very quick turnaround on these jobs, um, on the design. Uh, and we've uh, we've been we've successfully are in the end stages of all of these jobs. They're either closed out or almost closed out. So a bit more. Um, I've, I've spoken to this a bit. The tunnel is two miles long from Point Alex Renew to Point 001. 
Um, and we also have the uh, hoof front interceptor that's half a mile long. Basically what we found was this is an, the exact layout of where our existing Commonwealth interceptor is. We're going to be open cutting that and removing that interceptor and upsizing it for this other interceptor. There's actually, because um, we're very space limited at Alex Renew, we have a lot of things shoved into um, some of these new facilities and you'll get to see that later, but we have actually two pump stations in the larger shaft, which is about 65 feet wide. And then there'll be a superstructure built on top of that to make that happen. So what are some of the different components? We found this to be really useful as we uh, shared this information with our community members. Uh, those of you that are familiar, you'll see the deep shaft, you'll see where the tunnel aligns, and then of course you have the diversion facilities. We'll get into this more, but you can see, and you'll hear me repeat over and over about multiple benefits. Uh, one of the one of the things that we feel and value here at Alex Renew is that our public gets to see their in water investments at work. And because we had to create some new land here at, at the request of, of the Riverkeeper, we were able to create this beautiful promenade that will take residents right out, almost touching the Potomac River and being able to look upstream all the way to DC and downstream to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Uh, so it's really a creative solution to um, what will be some tough construction for those residents that live in that area. The really cool thing is, of course, the tunnel boring machine that will launch from Alex Renew and end its journey at Outfall 001. And you can see some of the specs there. It is currently being, I think it's almost done design and being built over in Germany. Um, I'm going to say it wrong, but I think it's like Schwano, Germany. Um, and the manufacturer is Herring Connect. And you can see some of the um, stats around that tunnel boring machine that uh, are underway. You can see the cutter head and some of the pieces. Uh, this has been really uh, helpful diagrams. Herring Connect has some great videos that help people really understand just how long this is. It's, you know, over a football field, plus the, the, the high tech piece that really goes into building these tunnels. Uh, so the community helps understand these graphics are important. We still get questions. Am I going to feel the tunnel boring machine when it goes, you know, under the road? No, it's over a hundred feet deep. Uh, we want to make sure we stay in a, a particular level, the Potomac clay level to run this machine so that it's, um, balanced correctly and does what it needs to do. Over here, this is uh, super cool um, uh, as an operator, as well as the, as the general manager. It does give me a little trepidation when I look at just the spaghetti of pumps and motors and pipes and um, different pump stations and levels. This goes about 150 feet deep uh, that we are going to have to maintain and manage, but I know my team is up to it. And then you can see how we've squeezed in a four-story tall superstructure to cover up, to pull out plastics and grit, um, pieces of equipment, house the um, mechanical electrical pieces as well to make this odor control, can't forget that, uh, to make this whole system work. One of the really um, important things we did in order to keep this program on track was we took we tried to minimize risk as much as possible and really relied heavily on risk registers. One of the things that we did uh, with our owner's advisor was really try to come up with what was the geologic profile um, and put that in the contract to eliminate some, well, not eliminate, but minimize as much as possible the unknowns associated with uh, drilling under the ground and, and that deep. So you can see the amount of uh, borings that we did the amount of soil sampling we did. And you can see here is where we're launching it. The depth uh, where we're going through with the waterfront tunnel, there are some areas that's really interesting how there's some deep spots where we come out of the Potomac clay uh, and do go into this alluvium. Uh, this was a, a good talking point as we negotiated with the uh, design build teams uh, and they are prepping their machine to be aware of uh, what they need to do during these times, looking at interventions, making sure that they're safe as they dig this tunnel. So <clears throat> it's easy to design a program uh, and make it happen, but this is a very front-facing program. 
we knew at the get-go we had to have the community's involvement. They needed to understand it. They needed to feel that ownership um, as well as have a play in the engineering piece that went into it. And so one of the, as you know, as we talked about, there's a, uh, a number of commissions and, and groups that help um, make these programs real for the, for the council and give some feedback. So we've had two and we're in the middle of our third right now with our construction group. They're all called stakeholder advisory groups. There was one before Alex Renew took ownership of those outfalls in 2018 that's shown in green. Uh, really good feedback from that team. We had a number of different options on what was the best solution for our community. And you can see they picked what, what, what we call the, the option B plus unified tunnel, which is really what River Renew is founded upon. Um, we also met some, um, met the requirements, but they challenged us to see if we couldn't do more. Uh, with the setup and design of the system. And so we incorporated that as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and to really make sure Old Town is old, obviously. Uh, and it's, you know, buildings come, were built in the, you know, early 1700s. They don't have foundations. They're, there's just a lot of unknowns there. It's one of the reasons that they couldn't separate the combined sewers. Um, there's just no way to do that. Uh, a lot of historic impacts. So really asked us to be thoughtful as we design these tunnel systems to take that into play. Then we went into a design stakeholder advisory group. Uh, they helped us get out into the community. They were like grassroots advocates. It was a wonderful uh, partnership with that community group. They helped us with the procurement criteria where we um, did a 50-50 split on technical and cost parameters with the um, bid of that design build job um, and helped us with our RFP for that uh, and also um, helped with the, the community to understand when we were out there doing tunnel borings and surveying work, all the things we needed to do really quickly so we could put together a really strong RFP document. Right now we're in this construction stakeholder advisory group moment where we are uh, starting the construction progress. Uh, you'll see some of the outreach that we are doing in terms of videos. Uh, we need to work with the contractor to shut some roads down. What's important to the community? Hey, don't forget the bike, bike paths, which we had done. Uh, and so we went back and, and worked that program in. It's the little details that can just demolish trust in the community and, and really delay your jobs. So it's vital that we are able to translate this really fast moving job, um, highly technical job uh, down to our community. And then they can give us this really great feedback so that we can be successful in executing um, the job to meet the law, to meet that deadline of July 1st, 2025, to build trust in the community as well. So how did we do this? What did it look like? We looked at a number of different ways of mitigating uh, the CSOs to meet the various requirements, both the CSO law as well as those um, super restrictive TMDL requirements. You heard me say that we couldn't do the, separate, um, the separation of the combined systems because of the historic nature of Old Town, the way that those pipes were tied into some of the homes, the lack of foundations, there's just a number of structural things that disallowed this option. You saw the overview map of Old Town. There's not a lot of room for green infrastructure, especially at the, the capacity and size that would be needed to uh, mitigate to those TMDL levels. Uh, end of pipe treatment, um, that was a non-starter. There's just no room to put that in. Plus, getting the permitting would be difficult. So we, at the end of the day, were left with storage tanks, the tunnel system, uh, a conveyance tunnel, or like we call it, the interceptor system, um, and then the wet weather treatment that we could or could not do at the plant. And so Alex Renew uses our board's vision and our strategic outcomes. And from that, we've cascaded down a decision model from those outcomes in, in within each of those elements of the five outcomes the board has set for us to meet. Uh, there are, I guess, 
kind of some criteria, um, some outcomes, some measures that we measure against. It's not just lowest cost, but it's, you know, life cycle costs. What's the best overall long-term cost? Uh, when we look at things, there's safety, there's um, how well can it be adapted for future use? And you see some of those listed there on the left-hand side. This is just a, a smattering, um, not the complete decision model list. And we looked at both the storage tank locations and options, which you can see in purple, which we have here for 002 and also for 001. And we also looked at it for the tunnel options, which are um, the, the blue dotted lines. These are very generic for, for this purpose right now. There's a number of different routes that we'll go into. Uh, and we scored them. And uh, we scored them with the public as part of that stakeholder advisory group and got their feedback. And you can see that um, at the end of the day, um, while there may have been some advocates for the, the tanks, uh, the tunnels came out on top and everybody understood why, why that engineering decision, why that was so important for us uh, to do. And here it is, here's Alex Renew's, you know, 33 acres uh, where we clean um, on average about 40 million gallons with a design capacity of 54 million gallons uh, here in the corner. We have a nutrient management facility over here. This is also part of our facilities as well as our um, administration building. So we, this is the heartbeat. We, um, at the end of the day with the tunnel system, ran the tunnel into the plant uh, and ran this interceptor into this large pumping station. We also found that um, this was a lot of flow. And at some point in extreme wet weather, we would need to actually off, offload some of those flows back into 001 and use it a little bit for storage. Uh, as well as use this wet weather treatment. We use UV disinfection. Um, and we've upscaled that UV disinfection so that we can run an additional 40 MGD in peak conditions to continue to meet that TMDL requirement. So there's a lot that went into this. At first, we thought we were going to use chlorine and, and did a number of tests uh, over the summer with some interns to see what would really work. But at the end of the day, we found um, ways to maneuver through this incredibly tight site to make this happen. And just so you know, what you see on top is about half of our treatment. The rest of it is all underground and connected. So we make very efficient use of our space. We talked a little bit about climate change. The, the stakeholder advisory groups, both in the um, planning and design phases, were very adamant that we take a look at this and really try to put it into our design as, as much as we can, as much as with what we know uh, going forward. And so you can see some of the information that was shared. We brought in a subject matter expert uh, to talk to the community to, to help us understand what are the challenges with this, what's the, what's the current state of knowledge, uh, and help us uh, make sure that what we're putting in place still meets what could be out there in terms of climate resiliency and precipitation. So we picked this higher range, this red range, which you can see here, and modeled it against what our design parameters were. And you can see what those modeled out um, overflows look like. So here's what we currently are, the big dark blue bars. The light blue is what will be happening um, after 2025, upon the completion of River Renew. And then in, 20, in 2100, uh, we modeled those flows given this higher um, level of precipitation noted for climate resiliency. And you can still see that we are within um, the CSO uh, mandates and requirements. So uh, we did uh, work with the community to ad address as much as possible their climate um, concerns. So getting the community bought in, right, taking the complicated pieces of a construction and tunnel project and making it real for our community. So we had a number of listening sessions. You can see some photos from some of the different ones where we reached out uh, to at each of the outfalls at our own plant. Um, and now with COVID, switching that to virtual meetings. Uh, which are all online. Uh, and you can see we got good participation 
Sometimes uh, if there was still some concern, we often went into people's homes to make the presentations and help them to understand what was going to go on, get their feedback uh, and make them stronger. And you can see some of our staff here. They all um, have no gray hair at these photos, but um, it's very different right now. Uh, but they are working really hard and give up a lot of their time uh, to help serve the public. So this was another piece. We talked about the tunnels and getting that, that feedback. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. We created this, what we call spaghetti map of, all right, where could all the tunnels go and what are all the different impacts? And then we went to these listening sessions. We worked with the SAG and said, give us your thoughts. What are we missing here? What's important to you when we execute this tunnel program? And so a lot of it, and you see on the left, uh, focused on make sure you don't go under existing structures. Really try to stay away from that. And you can see that we have some alignments that do that. A big one, um, which is really tough for Alex Renew, but really respectful of the community, is do all the mining and mucking from Alex Renew. Again, it's where we get into those 100 plus trucks a day, plus all the deliveries Alex Renew needs to keep operational. Um, happening right here. Uh, we can go out through Eisenhower and then what you see here is 495, the Beltway, and here is the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So uh, we do have an easier access uh, and it's easier for us to continue that mining rather than be in a section where you just have a number of homeowners who are going to be um, already distressed about the, the construction going on um, without having all those trucks rumbling down uh, through Old Town. Uh, 002, that was a more difficult one. Um, you can see there, we didn't have a lot of options of, of where to pick up um, that that uh, combined sewer, uh, given the location of it. And so the community was not a big fan of these two and really asked us to move it as close to or as far away from um, the school. There's a St. Mary's School there uh, and these residences much as possible. There's also a community garden, believe it or not, that was super important to the community. Um, and so we took their advice and moved it down. Uh, we wanted to stay within the Potomac formation. That was important be just from a, a risk mitigation standpoint for safety for those tunnelers. Um, uh, kudos to those people who built tunnels. I was in one, it is not something I could do day in and day out. Um, it, it's really tough work, but it's really technical too. Um, so I'm really happy with Trailer and their performance. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a really safe job moving forward. And, and part of that is also keeping this, um, keeping this earth balance, this pressure at a certain level um, to minimize those interventions and minimize the risk to those workers. This is a tough one. The avoid piles, believe it or not, there was a lot of piles both here, which you would expect, were built on a landfill. Everything here is pile supported. Uh, getting under the highway, there's a substation here we have to avoid. There's a number of piles here. This is the old Ford plant that uh, used to build um, Jeeps and things for the war. You've got uh, somewhere up here, we've got the torpedo factory. Uh, and of course, there's some old um, foundational piles here. So we want to really make sure that we don't run into any of those while we're uh, building the tunnel. This was an interesting one. Um, you know, not ever having done tunnels, it has been a great engineering learning experience about everything you have to think about to build a tunnel um, is these curves. So if they're less than this 100 or, or 1200 foot um, curve radius, it really becomes tough for the tunnel uh, machine to make those curves and you need some specialty uh, equipment to make that happen. And so we were looking to lessen that uh, that diameter. And then the depths that we needed for the pumping back at the pumping station for us, what's it gonna take to move the water? Um, how can we minimize the amount of land that we use? We're, we're one of the few uh, plants, I think, in the country that when we look at options, part of what you have to do is look at land cost because we can't get that land back and we have no room for expansion. Uh, going forward. 
So what did that look like in real time in these drawings that we had to put together? So here's a sketch of the waterfront tunnel that we developed as we move forward with the community's input. And you can see what we were talking about, what we would talk about with the community. Here's the, the little pinkish line, dotted line, shows our historic structure boundary. Um, and you can see some of our historic structures here. Um, this is one of the streets we really wanted to stay away from, streets that were used. We're under Church Street here, but it's um, a street that's very rarely used. We wanted to stay away from this historic cemetery uh, as well. You don't know. Um, one of the things that the church told us is they're not really sure where people are buried. Um, and we wanted to make sure we didn't have to go get uh, any permissions from any of those uh, burial folks. It's really hard to get for a number of reasons. Um, we have a school here, um, St. Mary's School. About 450 cars a day show up in the morning to drop their children off. They make a big turn and they leave. And then in the afternoon, we do it again. They come, they pick up their children and they leave. So we really wanted to make sure we kept this road area open to allow for that free flow of, of community members in and out of this um, school that uh, needed to happen. And you can see this is where we ended up with that uh, diversion chamber. Uh, I will say our design build team has come back with a little different um, layout, which is actually less impactful, which is really um, an intangible benefit to our community as we move this job forward. And of course, those very important community gardens to stay away from. And then we were able, by picking this um, southernmost alignment, to really minimize that, that radius impact. We've mentioned this before. It's important when you build something to, to look to the future, to look at what your values are. We have a board vision that speaks to people um, being able to touch and feel and, and be engaged with their water bodies um, in, in, in the most sound and financial way possible. And so when you get more than one use out of these large gray infrastructure projects or any infrastructure project, especially around water, the, the benefit to your community is exponential. Not only are you protecting public health, not only are you creating healthier waterways, but you're giving people that blue mind science. You're giving people a space to go that they didn't have before. You're allowing people to say, hey, I helped build this. This is my money hard at work. Uh, and they're more willing to help you continue to maintain it and, and provide that benefit. So here we talked a little bit about Outfall 1, where we created this promenade. Um, this is the extension of the existing um, 001 Outfall. Here's 34, 34 right now are underneath Duke Street, which is right there in that culvert area. Uh, and we're gonna rehabilitate that uh, riparian buffer, um, which is concrete and overgrown with invasives um, down on this one side where we had the easement. And then, of course, Jones Point, uh, where we did get that EA, and um, uh, we are going to redo that area with all native plantings. Um, in you can see the little hills, see some of our facilities right there. Uh, right now, it was really overgrown, and so it'll give them that sense of local um, and natural uh, back when we're done. So now we're into construction. So what does construction look like for us? This is the really cool piece of it. Um, if you're an engineer, um, maybe not a homeowner, but here is Outfall 001. Um, this is about three acres. We have an easement for this. This is actually owned by a developer right now. Um, um, so we have a temporary easement for construction. We have to be off in a certain amount of time. Again, um, really constraining this job and our ability to do it. Um, and then we have a permanent easement for these diversion facilities that we're going to be putting in. Right now, the outfall ends right here. The river keeper came back and asked, this is Orinoco Bay. Um, because it's here, it never flushes um, and it really degrades the water quality in here. So working with the Potomac River Keeper, we came up with a solution that added some land, uh, but ended up making for a better solution long-term overall by extending that outfall here to um, just at the point of the Potomac River. 
So what does that look like? This is what um, the schedule looks like for us to meet that schedule. You can see us right now, we're in that site prep mode. This um, scrim just went up. Uh, we're having a groundbreaking next week. Then we'll start with this supportive excavation, uh, which is the blue color you see here. Once, once the supportive excavation is in, we'll go ahead and excavate out the inside of that um, shaft in this time period. Then we'll start to build the permanent structures that are needed within the shaft. Um, make that happen. We'll wait for the tunnel boring machine to show up. We'll pull her out. We'll continue to complete the structures, the um, permanent uh, near surface structures, and then we'll restore the site. So this is a little bit of what it looks like. This is how we help the community visualize what's going to happen. And so we've done it in a video setting. So we've just taken that plan view uh, and put it on its side. Here is the existing outfall. Orinoco Bay, Orinoco Park, residents are along here. Um, and then you have the ground structure here in the Potomac River. So as we click through this, we do site prep. We have to put in these um, barriers to keep the water out. Remember, we're going to create a new land mass here. Uh, we'll get the site ready for the in and out of the truck traffic. Um, here we'll fly in, if only we could do that the trailers um, and the facilities to help with that, bring in a crawler crane, put in the sheet sheeting uh, to create this land space. Then we're going to go ahead and drain it. You can see, take the water out. Again, we have time of year restrictions. Uh, just one more thing we have to work around on scheduling this job. Uh, once we have that, we'll bring in um, some dirt, fill that area in because it, we need it to settle and dry. We'll bring in the second um, Wayne the crawler crane. He's going to come in and put that supportive excavation in. Again, we watch it fly in. Uh, not that easy. And then we have this little bump out. So that little bump out is to allow the tunnel boring machine to break through um, into the shop. We bring in an excavator. He goes all the way down to the bottom. We have the trucks coming in and out with that traffic or uh, with that dirt. Uh, once he's done with that, we seal up that bottom. You can see the space we have reserved for the tunnel boring machine to come in. Let's see, is she on her way yet? There she comes. So very slowly, she comes under the ground. People can see that it's not affecting them. Uh, it's well under the river. Uh, she breaks through that little bump out. She comes up. We remove the cutter head uh, and take that away. Uh, then we remove the actual tunnel boring machine. There we go. Um, and take that, take her away. And then we come back and start on the surface structures, the near surface structures. So we drive some piles uh, and we will be going, go ahead and put in, dig out the dirt we just put in so that we can put in those near surface structures and build that concrete uh, and connect up that existing outfall to the new outfall. We cap off that shaft. And here is the final product. So you see the new outfalls. You see the new promenade. It connects up to Orinoco Bay Park. Um, we've got a cleaner Orinoco Bay, um, as well as a cleaner Potomac. And then the developer gets their site back and can put on their uh, approved development. So more importantly is what's going on at the plant. So um, Alex Renew uh, and its 100 employees have taken on the burden of putting this infrastructure in place for the next four years. We have a very tight site. Uh, you can see at the end of the day um, what we will be building there, the larger 65 foot diameter shaft to the 35 or so foot diameter shaft where we'll be launching and moving that tunnel boring machine. Uh, you can see some of the risk we have with some of our existing infrastructure. Uh, we're testing that now to make sure we've got those monitors for ground movement in place. Um, we have uh, the hoof run interceptor coming in, picking up this um, hoof run junction chamber, which is a, a built-in SSO point that needs to be eliminated uh, according to our permit. This is the magic box that we have created. Um, one of our engineers is very talented and instead of using more pumping, 
was able to really figure out how to divert the different flows uh, by gravity so that we don't ever have to worry about having backups in these systems uh, and then uh, onward into our facility. So what does that look like as well? So this is where the building was. This site, if you go to the River Anew website, you have a time-lapse camera and you can see it's a lot more compact now. Um, this is only about one and a half acres. It's really not enough for the contractor to do his work. We've um, secured some other properties uh, across the creek uh, near our uh, administration building to help with that. Um, but this is a very tight site for him right now. So I'd encourage you to take a look. There's the old admin building and lab. It went away just like that. Uh, you can see them putting their, uh, similar to what we've done before uh, on the previous one, you've got two shafts going in, two crawler cranes with the um, supportive excavation going in, keeping the plant operational. Now we move in, we build over that uh, outfall. We start the tunnel process from the plant and continuously building all the way out to 01, like we just talked about. Uh, here the innards go into the shaft and some other uh, near surface structures. Uh, with that, um, now we move into the different floors. There's several different floors to house the different pump stations, picking up the grit at the bottom. Then we clean it all up, put a top on it and put our four story uh, max uh, superstructure on top of this. You can see we put some solar panels in um, and at the end of the day, we green it up uh, and move it along. And with that, here are some renderings. You can see our existing biological reactor basins. They are covered. We have five of those um, to help with odor control because we are so uh, centrally located in a dense urban community. Um, we continue to keep our roadway open, but this is the only site they have to build those two shafts and drop that machine in. And these are just some renderings. Uh, we hope to get either LEED or Envision um, certifications on this project, on these buildings going forward, um, and, and allowing it to be used as another educational tool for our community about water, about environmental protection. You can see we've strategically design some windows uh, into the building so people can look in and see what comes out and how they can help us by not putting that um, on the ground or um, you know how they can think about the trash that they, they throw out um, and use the system wisely. So that is what that will look like. And then most importantly for us is um, education. This is a huge opportunity to build STEM uh, in your community, um, both for the kids as well as the adults. So how are we communicating this out? So we have a, a team that works diligently on thinking about this, not just as an aside, but because we are actually impacting schools. We have St. Mary's School. We didn't talk about um, 003 and 004, which are right by Duke Street. They actually, uh, there's, uh, several daycares there, um, over 100 children um, are in those daycares. And so we have tried to create ways where if we can reach the kids, we can reach the parents uh, and they'll understand what is going on when all of a sudden their kids um, or their daycare provider can't get them to the African-American park um, or they have to use some other methodology to you know, get outside, why that is and how long it's going to be and who Chloe is and what it means for water in our community. So um, we've created Chloe and Chloe's Corner. So Chloe hangs out with Moxie, who is Alex Renew ma uh, mascot, uh, and she helps us do more to create healthier waterways. And she has a whole slew of folks um, uh, to help her do that. And we've actually created a storybook series um, that uh, with an actual storybook that will be distributed at our groundbreaking um, that, and it also will be used to help educate those um, families at the school, at the daycares about what's coming and what all this equipment is and why we have to build it this way to, and yes, we know you'll be inconvenienced at the end of the day. However, you're going to get this really great water quality and, and great ways to touch nature and water. 
Um, we also use her on um, signage uh, at our at the various locations. You can see um, at 001 there was a an old old warehouse. And we needed to let people know that was going to come down. Uh, people were pretty anxious. And so she, Chloe had our friend, Edie the Excavator, go and tear down that um, warehouse. We actually got a lot of hits. This is mostly for the kids. But you see this QR code? We have great photos of all the adults who ran by or walked by taking pictures of that serendipitous, you know off to the side um, and checking it out later. So uh, it's a great way to educate people. Um, and yeah, it might not be, you know, the exact engineering terms, but people really enjoyed this and they understood. And instead of getting a lot of complaints about the noise or whatever, we got a lot of questions about, hey, what's coming next? Hey, can you know, can we see how this works? Um, usually with COVID, we'd have people on site or usually without COVID, we'd have people on site. But with COVID, we've had to get really creative um, in bringing people in and engaging them around this. And most importantly, you can help. We name the tunnel boring machine. You can see the six names uh, right now on our contest. The contest uh, ends October 1st. You can go to this website and pick your name. Each of these women had something to do with engineering, science, um, or locally here in the Alexandria area, something to do uh, with environmental justice. So go read their little bios. I encourage you to do that um, and uh, help us name the tunnel boring machine. Why a girl? No, not just because I'm, I'm you know, a girl and in charge of the, the authority. Basically, it's, um, it's always been that way. Um, the uh, patron saint of minors is uh, St. Barbara. And so we've always named TBMs for luck and, and for um, that reason uh, after women to help help with that, that security around them. We bless the tunnel boring machines. It's really, having been down there, you know, whatever it takes to feel secure, um, I'm all for it. And so uh, I really encourage you to uh, go and help us name the tunnel boring machine. And then you can see we've also um, do some things just to engage children as well. So this from soup to nuts and everything in between um, it is a, a broad brush program. It is moving really fast. I know that my team has been, there's been a lot of stress uh, on the team. And so things like this really help us kind of unwind and remember why we do what we do uh, in engineering. We can solve any problem and we are, we're going to, we're on schedule to get this job done in July, 2025. Uh, still um, amazing, giving a lot of the constraints there. Uh, and, and and so that's great news for engineers. We also need the community to be part of that and celebrate the wins with us. And so with that, um, I'm going to end here and happy to talk more about it. But when we do engineering work, when we solve problems, we have to make sure we solve more than one. We don't have the resources anymore to be siloed in our solutions. Is there Are there ways to be more and do more for the community and engage the community so at the end of the day, they can say, I built this because they're standing on it or they see it or they touch it. Um, we need that input from the public. They can, especially in a well-educated area like here, they can shut a job down just by a call to the mayor and, and they're very uh, connected to city council here. So their input is vital and you really need to not just hear their input, but listen to it. What are the real concerns? Um, and they have been really helpful. I've been incredibly happy and pleased with the engagement and feedback from all of our community groups. They, they're helping us put on a really good job and they're helping us think about the little details that sometimes get missed uh, as we're trying to solve the bigger problem. We need to focus on the env environment uh, as well as the technical solutions. Um, always think about too, how can you do more? How can you reach kids, right? We have this dearth of, of, of trades, people who want to do operations, who want to work in, in the environmental field. We need engineers, right? Start them young. And we have really cool projects where we can start them young. And, um, Good engineering, yeah, you need those technical skills, but you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to translate and listen uh, and move forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end um, 
my talking portion of this and happy to turn it back over to Marissa. Thank you so much, Karen. Now we're gonna open up for questions. Um, if you have a question, just type it in on the left-hand side of your screen where it says attendee chat and Karen can just answer as many as she can. And if you would like to email her directly with questions, um, Karen, if you don't mind, can you type in your email address in the attendee chat uh, panel can. to the left-hand side? That would be great. Yep. There you okay, go. I, I see a couple of questions. They are um, up top where that speech bubble is. There's actually two, two spots to um, answer questions, which makes, makes it confusing. Um, do you see that up top? I do, I do. Um, and they're both great questions. Any water reuse plan on this project? So uh, we looked at actually running a purple pipe inside that tunnel up top, but we couldn't uh, meet some of the code requirements. We do have it actually on the hoof run interceptor side. So we'll we'll be running, um, laying that purple line up to Duke Street uh, and make that happen. Uh, we don't have any plans for what it will look like at the end of the day, but we'll have that ability to be able to use the reclaimed water we generate here. Um, we have a pump station and we use a lot of that purple pipe water uh, here in our environmental center and the fountain and our fish tank to try to get people to understand it um, and engage around it. Is it conveying only stormwater? No, this is um, this is a combined sewer system. It's a water quality project. So at the end of the day, we're, we're capturing this combined sewage, not stormwater. So this is totally independent of the stormwater piece. Um, the tunnel diameter is uh, 12 feet. I, the flow rate, I'm not quite sure of. I believe it holds 8 million gallons. Um, I can verify that with, with you later. Um, just if you want to send me an email, I can verify those numbers. Okay, great. I don't see any more questions at this time. Like I said, you can always email Karen with questions. And we're going to wrap it up for today. Um, our next webinar is scheduled for October 6th. It's titled Decarbonation of an integrated urban water, energy, and solids management. A link to sign up for that webinar will be displayed shortly. Oh, we have some questions coming in. Let's, <laughs> let's pause and you can answer those questions. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, no problem. Yeah, I'd love to funding piece out. Um, so it is funded totally by rates. Um, we have a WIFI loan uh, for, uh, I can't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, about 327 million, give or take. We have a clean water revolving loan fund uh, loan from the Commonwealth of Virginia for about 185 million. And then we have been successful in getting some grants. Uh, it's a partnership with the state, this program. Um, since they passed the law, they're helping us. Uh, in total, we uh, have $90 million committed. We've received 50 million of that. And then with the new ARP money that the Commonwealth received, uh, Alex Renew, uh, along with the city of Richmond and city of Lynchburg, both CSO communities here uh, in our Commonwealth went together and we um, to ask for some of that state art money. And we got 50 million of that. So it's a, about 140 million that'll be offset by grants. And then Fairfax County pays a very small portion. They have some I and I that's being remediated through the three, four piece of that. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, so that's that um, the environmental impact assessment for the project. Yes, we had to um, complete a, an environmental assessment. Um, we had, right, we had an EA, an environmental assessment, not an environmental impact uh, statement that was required under NEPA um, that we worked with the um, National Park Service on. Uh, and we received the, um, oh, basically that was because we impacted those federal lands uh, there at Jones Point. Jones Point is a, a national park um, going forward. And so we were, we were successful in receiving um, their approval for that EA. We did not conduct any water quality model, uh, 
water quality modeling studies. What we do have in place is we have worked for several years with um, George Mason University. They do some sampling of various locations upstream and downstream of our outfall, as well as along, along the Potomac River. Um, <coughs> and um, what we hope is um, we've refined that a little bit to help with um, looking at the constituents from combined sewers. And uh, they'll continue, they've continued those studies. Um, I think we were a little weak during the COVID year, but we'll do that every summer um, to make sure that we are um, looking at the different things. And, you know, we do the water quality modeling itself um, to comply. So we'll, we'll do some actual testing in that partnership with GMU. Hopefully it answers that question. Um, what was the most challenging question or issue um, from the community and how did you address it? Um, well, that's actually a really good question. I'm, I'm, it went so fast and there were so many, I'm not, I'm not quite sure uh, which was the most challenging. I think the most challenging was, well, there were a couple. One was the alignment of the tunnel, um, how to keep it out of, you know, to meet all the requirements the public had, right? They didn't, they wanted it far away. They didn't want it under buildings, keeping away from um, historic structures um, and, then, and then getting it through the park service land. Uh, that was one of the issues. It, it, I mean, that alignment you saw, that's about the, you can't deviate more than a foot either way. Um, you know, just a, a really, really tough thing. There was a lot of feedback, you know, in trying to manage that. And I think the other, um, the other challenge was Duke Street, right? There's only two main roads into downtown Old Town, and that's King Street and Duke Street. And in the very beginning, there was talk of us having to actually shut down Duke Street um, to build some of the infrastructure to capture you know, capture and contain that flow from outfalls 003 and 004. Um, like I said, I have a great team. They were very creative. Uh, when I said, yeah, we're not shutting down Duke Street, figure out a way around it. And they did that. Um, so that one, that was challenging. It took a lot of brain power to come up with um, what they did. It's still going to be impactful. There's some, you know, lane closures but only for short durations and certain periods of time. Uh, we were also really lucky to work with, um, we impact a hotel there, the residents in and working with those owners. Again, really short time frame we have to, to work, get in and out of that area. That's the other thing. And some of those easements with the owners, um, they worked with us, but they also said, you only have this much time and you gotta be off the site. So there's a number of things that um, we've worked with. Uh, to try to to try to um, listen to the community uh, and ease some of their concerns and pain. A lot of times, too, there are things we couldn't address, and you just have to be upfront and say, you know, we heard you. We know that you wanted it like this. Um, we still have to run traffic or truck traffic or things like that, and just shared. Here's here's a graphic of how many trucks are going to be there, um, and here's what we're going to do because we know this is important. We're going to make sure they tarp these trucks in a certain way. And here's the wheel wash. And we're going to put a person there to inspect every truck that goes out. So while we couldn't deal with their concern about how many trucks, we did try to honor and respect their concern about the truck traffic um, and, and the dirt and all of that that goes with trucks. Uh, and that seemed to be um, very well received. Um, so there's a question about STEM education and metrics and budget. So I can't speak to the budget. It's tied into uh, part of what we do um, globally as, as the um, owner's advisor, as part of our own budget, right? It's Alex Renew and River Renew together. Um, we've also asked the contractor, uh, the design builder to partner with us. So they speak at our community listening sessions um, and uh, participate in Earth Day and things like that. So I don't have that broken down um, into a, a set dollar value. 
I can go back and try to see if I can get you a general number if interested. The metrics piece, I'm all ears. If somebody has a really good way of measuring a tangible value for that, um, that would be great. I know from an intangible perspective, we when we don't get complaints, um, when we get people who like our SAG, who actually smile at these meetings, some of these people have been on SAGs for years and, and they're known to be like curmudgeon and they're not curmudgeon They're actually helpful and happy uh, to and give us really good feedback. Um, it, I think that that's part of it uh, going forward. Um, in terms of, I can give you people, we have maybe like two, two and a half uh, FTEs to support um, the outreach effort and the engineering, you know, from the engineering uh, staff and our staff to make that happen. So that's kind of how we look at it from a budgeting perspective. And then, this is a good question. Did the um, regulatory deadlines resonate with the community at all in trying to communicate the need? Um, so it's really interesting. Um, when we first took this over, when this first happened, there people were just mad that, that they were being mandated to do something. Um, there was a whole section of Old Town that was really focused on, um, this isn't fair, this is, this is a legacy issue, we've been doing it for years, we don't, we're really small, we don't have that much overflow compared to, say, our neighbor, GC Water, or the city of Richmond, um, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do it so fast? Um, and I think we were able we were able to change that messaging around to, hey, this is really about healthier waterways. It's about the people who live upstream and downstream uh, and removing those things um, and helping create, you know, a better water quality, a better uh, life here in the, in our community. And, for the most, you're always going to have the people that say no. But for the most part, we were able to change that dynamic. And then when we were able to show, hey, this is doable, and we're excited to do it, and we want you to be part of this, they they build on that positivity. They build on that excitement. So how you communicate um, and, and, and your body language and your energy really helps set the tone and, and dynamics of your communication with the community. Uh, and like I said, I have a young, energetic team. They loved talking about this stuff. Um, and when you show that and show that, yeah, I'm going to, we're going to do this and we're glad to do this and we can't wait to be part of this. And yeah, it's going to be tough during it, but at the end of the day, look at what you're going to have, right? So always leaders are dealers in hope. Always focus on that end game on what people are going to end up with. And um, I would say, you know, people grumble about the rates and rate increases and they're like, yeah, but I get it. I know what I'm paying for now. So I, I don't like the fact that my rates are going up, but I understand it and um, I'm okay with it. So hopefully I was able to answer all those questions. I don't know that I missed anything. Thank you so much, Karen, for answering all those questions. Um, that wraps up our event for today. And like I said before, our next webinar, we will have uh, the link up as soon as this session gets closed out. And thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Thank everyone you. have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.